Hi, and welcome to More Than a Refresh, a podcast about data and the people who wrangle it. I'm Amanda Nystrom, the Chief Operating Officer at Command Prompt, a leader in open source excellence since 1997. We hope that you enjoy the podcast today and contact us for your Postgres and full stack needs, including 24-7 support. Find us at 503-667-4564 at commandprompt.com or at sales at commandprompt.com. Enjoy. More Than a Refresh is brought to you by Greenplum Database. Greenplum is a PostgreSQL-based, open-source, massively parallel database for analytics, machine learning, and AI. A VMware technology, Greenplum is a modern database that isn't limited by your data size or vertical scaling limitations. For more information or to get in touch, visit greenplum.org. Welcome to More Than a Refresh, a podcast about data and the people who wrangle it. Today, we are recording from Queens, New York, Palo Alto, California, and Custer, South Dakota, just south of Mount Rushmore. Our guest today, and I apologize, I'm probably going to t- brutalize your last name, but it's Divya Borgov? Bargov. Bargov. It's like Bargov. Oh, oh, I'm... I'm Awesome. We're going to let you say that. Uh, Tell us, you're the Engineering Senior Director at VMware. That's good. And our topic today is managing large international teams of talent, specifically developers, correct? That's right. Yeah. I think that this will be an interesting topic for most of us. Uh, As you may or may not know, um, I'm the uh, founder of Command Prompt Incorporated, and we're a a white glove services team, and we've been remote forever. I mean, like since we've been fully remote since like Oh four. So while all these other companies have been like, Oh my, what are we going to do? I'm more like, good Lord, give it a break. But the reality is having remote teams has challenges and we're, I'd like us to get into that, but first, who are you and what is your background? Nice to meet you today, JD, and really awesome to be a, a part of this uh, channel here. And, uh, um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, let me introduce my name correctly. I'm Divya Bhargav. Gov is it's like government, right? So, so uh, Divya Bhargav, and uh, I have been a senior director for VMware for a bit, but been with Greenplum for the last close to six years now, and. Uh, I want to introduce myself as someone who has uh, worked in various locations, right? So uh, now I'm managing uh, international teams of talent, but I was one of them, right? Where uh, I worked in India, I worked in Singapore, and I worked in uh, US, right? I'm working in US and um, and yeah, and I'm uh, taking care of the Green Plum engineers and uh, making sure that we are delivering for the business, yeah. That's that's me. So for those that don't know, or, or, or guests that don't know, Greenplum is a hybrid, mostly open source. Um, the core engine is open source, uh, multi, what is it? It's called MPP, which is... Yeah, massively parallel Postgres. Um, and although it is pretty good at OLTP, its real core focus is, you know, OLAP. OLAP, and it's very, very good at handling the amount of data, or let me put it this way. Most people would consider a terabyte or two a large amount of data. A terabyte or two is nothing compared to what Greenplum can deal with. Uh, and it's, it's a really great platform. Uh, my understanding is that it is an eventual goal to be code parity with PostgreSQL.org. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh... We are actually actively working on that piece at this point and uh, uh, expect a Green Plum 7 uh, coming soon. We are uh, thinking of uh, uh, going beta as early as early next year. So Jan or Feb, uh, we are expe- and that's going to be code parity with Postgres 12. And That's what I was going to ask. So Postgres 12, um, and for those who guffaw at that, please understand that this is a massive undertaking. Green Plum forked way back, I think, in the eight days. Um, 
and to become code parity plus have the ability to add their features onto it is no small task. And I really do applaud Green Plum for trying to move forward in that direction. Um, let's, uh, beyond that, uh, when, how did you first, what is your background and how did you first get involved in tech? Sure. So, um, uh, my background is, uh, I was born and brought up in India and, uh, uh, a lot of people ask me, what is it that you wanted to be when, uh, you know, when you came up there, when you studied and, uh, did you want to like become an engineer or did you want to become like a pilot and all these things? But uh, at least the culture in India when I was growing up, right, uh, it was mostly uh, you have two professions to choose from. Like it's a very closed, <laughs> it used to be a very closed uh, community with respect to what people do, what, it's not just the parents, even children would start to think like that, okay, are you becoming an engineer or are you becoming a doctor, right? <laughs> so that's that's usually... Uh, At least the they're way. good professions. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Those are like literally, I never thought about becoming a pilot or uh, anything of that sort, right? So uh, it's is it an engineer or a doctor? And then I knew I was so bad at biology and uh, <laughs> I knew I, I was not going to become... A doctor so engineer was almost a default choice so uh, I can't yeah and and my my mom was an engineer too so uh, so that's how I got into like um, becoming an engineer and my dad got me this computer when I was in fourth grade and back then it was this uh, the whole big uh, PCXT where we have to use those floppy disks to boot up, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, at least, yeah, and it was an expensive one because those didn't come cheap back then. So uh, I knew I was uh, liking the computers, uh, working on computers. And so uh, I took up computer science and I studied in, uh, studied computer science actually in uh, engineering in uh, India. And then um, worked there uh, a few companies, CGI, Oracle, uh, for a good amount, like three to four years there, and then uh, decided to get married. Uh, and my husband wanted to study, and he uh, reg uh, uh, registered for a course in Singapore, National University yeah. of Singapore. So we decided to move. And... Uh, at that point, I was the breadwinner of the house, right? Like he was studying and I had to find a job and I looked out for some opportunities in Singapore. And um, while he initially went to study, uh, in no time, we decided that we're settling there. We had children and uh, 12 years passed. And at some point, uh, we decided that, okay, we had an opportunity coming here in in Palo Alto, uh, uh, he he moved from his job, and then I decided, okay, follow the family, and yeah, and moved to Palo Alto. And uh, uh, so, in uh, the the background per se in all these places, I've done, um, I've done, I've been an engineer, really done development, I've done consulting, and uh, so this is like tech sales consulting and things like that. Um, then uh, apart from that, I've also uh, been a manager. <laughs> right? so, so these are, uh, uh, and then moved to being, uh, moved up in the manager chain, become, became a director and a senior director. So um, yeah, that's, that's the background. Well, you know, that's a lot. That's really interesting. Management, I tried management, uh, being the founder of Command Prompt, I was kind of the de facto manager until about, I don't know, about eight years ago. And it, then my partner in life and in business now uh, came on board, and that's Amanda Nystrom. And we quickly realized that if I got out of her way, we grew a lot faster. <laughs> so I, I am not a manager by any stretch. I'm more of one of the, I have vision. I can see forward. I, I, I can like it's my gut will tell me where things are going and we were able to monopolize on that. But I'm kind of curious. I mean, by way of Singapore, so you went India, Singapore, and now you're in the States. We're talking about three very different cultures. 
um, even as diversified as the American culture is, there is still kind of an overlying, this is how it's done, just like any country, right? Um, in, in India, now my understanding is that it's kind of faded away, but culturally it's still there. There's a, a caste system. It is, is that still there? Is it more of a tribal thing or does it really exist? Uh, it, it still exists, but not so much in a professional life. You don't see that as much. Um, so you probably will end up seeing that more often when you're getting married, right? Like, uh, you, mm. you go to go through uh, a struggle if you, uh, let's say, choose a partner from a different cast, right? So, uh, so it's, uh, in that aspect, it still exists, uh, but it has faded away quite a bit. But in a professional life where you're coming to an office and uh, all that, it's it's really faded away. I, I should say that's uh, uh, barely existing. There's still uh, uh, religious conflicts as well that exist, uh, sure. right? Um, but again, all these are mostly driven by politics. <laughs> and so so uh, none of this happens much in like professional life. So it's it's it feels at this point, at least when I go back to India to work with the team there, it feels very much like working here in the US. Okay. And then with Singapore, what I find interesting about Singapore is I have a lot of peers who kind of look at Singapore as a, a potential model for where, you know, the United States society can go. And I really question that because, I mean, as beautiful as it is, as successful as it is, it's very authoritarian from my understanding. Is that, did you run into that at all? So, uh, definitely. I think, uh, I think the reason I chose being a manager was that because I've had so many managers from different places and also uh, I've seen both good, really, really good and bad managers, right? So, uh, so um, an example was, uh, uh, you know, during uh, when I was managing a particular company in Singapore, Literally, my manager asked me that, hey, I need to have your password so that when you're absent, I can check your email, right? Like, literally, this was, uh, I don't, I mean, and this is not okay. Like, there is that piece of, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have to be everyone, right? Like, this this could be an exception, like, and things have changed. And uh, it, I just landed with a bad manager. Uh, but uh, with respect to authoritarian, I think there is um, it, there is a part of it where uh, it's not as free sometimes, right? So uh, it's like if you're given some task, you have to go ahead and do it, right? So you can't question it too much. But then again, uh, this is where companies like VMware or Pivotal and all these, they've made a change, right? So when when I worked uh, in Singapore, I worked at Pivotal Labs, by the way. So when I worked there, it was really a very, very multicultural place, again, where we have people from all over. We had like, uh, you know, people from within, people from outside, uh, and um, it's it created a really good scene and you'd love to work there right and that's where i've got like the best managers as well so uh it's really important to uh uh be a part of a more varied culture uh it it really helps in making the whole place a better place to work in right so uh, you have you develop that empathy towards being with different types of people you know, it's interesting that you say that because obviously that's something that over the past, well, we've always struggled with it, but um, people as a whole, are, we're relatively tribal, right? And we kind of stick with our own, whatever the tribe is. And sometimes it's racial, sometimes it's, it's religious, sometimes it's a certain economic class, you know, they're varying different, you know, for me, it's until relatively recently, the majority of people I hung out with were open source folks, 
right? That was my tribe, as they say. Um, but you, you touched on something that's, it, that's exceedingly important uh, for everyone to understand. Being part of a tribe is fine. It provides security. It provides a peer network. It provides a helping hand when you need it. I mean, I don't like the lady, but she got one thing right. It takes a village, right? That exists and it is real. But most importantly, just because there is differentiation, forget the word diversity, just because there's differentiation within the tribe or you have a tribe next to you that is different, the thing that makes our culture, the, the United States culture, the most powerful and most opportunistic and most visionary in the world, even to this day with the problems that we're having and, and the dissent that we're having with the idea around that, is that we are inclusive. As a whole, most people don't care if you're white, black, brown, green, yellow. There, there are exceptions. I'm not denying that that doesn't exist. But you know, you walk down the street, people will smile at you. They'll say hi. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm currently sitting in a six window short bus. I am traveling the United States. Uh, as I mentioned, we're just south of Mount Rushmore right now. And occasionally, you know, I'm in Custer, South Dakota, which is a cowboy town. And I've gotten some strange looks. But the funny thing happened when I get those strange looks, I smile and wave. And they take a step back and smile and wave back. They still say good morning. They still say, I hope you have a good day. It's just that it's a little weird for them to see a short bus pull up in front of their cafe or their saloon or whatever, right? Most importantly, without going down a diatribe with this, is to remember that what makes us great, and I mean that as a people, is our willingness to accept and our willingness to use the strengths of each culture to the betterment of society. Right. Sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but you touched on it. Right. Um, um, okay, so what, uh, I mean, Pivotal a few years ago was rebought, from, well, and it was rebought from VMware. VMware spun them off when VMware acquired a bunch of stuff it doesn't know what to do with. And therefore, Pivotal arrived. And then suddenly, Pivotal got reintegrated into VMware. VMware still doesn't know what to do with them. Uh, that's my my opinion. That may not be VMware's opinion or Pivotal's opinion. And now you're about to be bought by Broadcom, right? Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. Um, when you get acquired by VMware as a part of Pivotal, um, what parts of Pivotal do you think carried on and helped made VMware stronger? Right. So... Uh... Just with as with the people we discussed, as you as you interact with more and more people, you get better as a person, right? And uh, it's you have that diversity that uh, comes in when you interact with more people. So, uh, in fact, Greenplum has actually gone through a very similar <laughs> uh, a, sim a, a very similar journey, right? Like we were part of EMC. Then Pivotal, then uh, 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 VMware, and now Broadcom, right? And uh, I, I will touch on the exact question that you asked that what part of Pivotal, but I also want to like expand that slightly on yeah, please do. what we learned from every part, right? Like, so uh, every of these acquisitions has been interesting and made Greenplum a very resilient team, right? So it's like you face all these challenges. So it's, it's like when something happens often enough, which has happened for us, I think we've gotten used to what an acquisition means. How do you get through this? And what are the good parts of the previous place you want to carry in? And what are the new parts, new good parts that you want to take in from the new company, right? So, uh, so from Pivotal to VMware, I think, uh, there are certain values that came from Pivotal to VMware, right? So uh, being lean, like I am, I'm surprised sometimes on how much a, a team of 100 or 120 engineers, uh, uh, how much of an impact they have with Greenplum, right? Uh, thanks to the open source, uh, but also it's, it's a pretty huge, uh, thing to stay lean and focused and uh, also uh, deliver iteratively, right? So we just, 
uh, we find out what's the little value that we can give to our customers and then expand on it rather than uh, sitting down and thinking about this whole thing and delivering it uh, after a long time only to realize that this was not even useful, right? So we just continuous feedback and iterative uh, uh, ways of working has come from Pivotal. And um, also uh, the culture of interactions and pairing and uh, be, being uh, uh, a part of the team together, it's, it's there everywhere, but I think Pivotal had some unique ways to uh, form teams and like things like retrospectives uh, where you, you look back end of the week to see what actually went well and what could be different and what what we need to change like this did not go well and being able to speak about this openly and making changes and understanding that you are responsible for this uh, this fix as well like it's not just about complaining that something went wrong but like what can we do to like uh, get this better next week right so it's like week on week we kind of retro how things go and all these practices, right, have come from Pivotal, right? And uh, if you see what came from the previous acquisition, EMC, which was EMC, like we actually had uh, a pretty good appliance out there, the DCA, and uh, we learned a lot from there. And then now when we are heading to VM, we, we are in VMware, we are thinking about how do you virtualize things, right? So uh, how can you put Greenplum on top of vSphere and make things work? So it's like uh, every of these acquisitions has opened up a new door for, for us, for Greenplum itself. And uh, we've had a, a variety of people from all these companies with us at, at this point, and it just makes uh, the team super resilient and uh, diverse. And uh, I think that's the great thing. And now going to Broadcom, right? Uh, I know the it's, it's always changes are scary, right? Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but looking back, you feel like, oh, that was the best thing that happened, right? So I, when I moved, multiple times right like even in my own personal journey it was like when i left singapore i'm like what am i leaving right like it's such a comfortable life and i have a helper sorting out things for me here and my kids were they seemed happy in school and um, everything's so predictable it's a super safe place i i was in a good company i didn't have any of those uh, challenges that everybody faces, right? So, but then it was a good move. So I'm, I am hoping that there's more positive to come uh, even in the next acquisition, so. You touched on something there. Um, one was Green Plum on vSphere, but I want to put a pin in that because that's a more of a technical discussion. But I'd like to go back. Um, you know, our producer interviewed you to give us an outline. And one of the things that I kind of skipped over, but you came back around. So now that I think it's important to talk about it, your children, right? You, you, you say you love your children. You love to have play dates. Right. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Because I love my children. I love my children with everything I have. I hated play dates. <laughs> so <laughs> please, I mean, I just, it just wasn't my, wasn't my jam. Okay. So <laughs> Right, right. So I have two boys, right? Uh, and I guess this is, uh, I, I have two nieces, my sister has two girls, right? And I see that they come back and tell everything what happened in school and what happened here. They're like, they're so, they communicate so much. And I'm still struggling as a parent to get that level of communication with my kids. They're like, what happened in school? Nothing normal, right? You know, there's not much they say about school. So, <laughs> so, so, so and I uh, am the most talkative person in the, in this house, right? So uh, my husband doesn't talk too much. My children don't talk too much. So this is the best way for me to actually get to know their friends. And uh, like, I, I actually understand a lot of what's going on. Uh, so I act, I love to like host play dates and uh, I, even 
I like the board games and all that. Like a lot of times they call me in and uh, it, it's, it's fun. So uh, I, I guess it's, it's harder when they are younger uh, because it's, mm -hmm. They're a little bit more, uh, I, I don't know how old your kids are. Uh, how old are they? So my kids are all, all, all but grown at this point. My okay, youngest sure. is 17. Um, but what was weird for me is that um, their mother and I divorced about a decade ago. So they were little, or at least my, my daughters were, my son was already grown. Um, and they were, we homeschooled them until high school. Okay. So you would go on the, you know, not really a play date. It would be more of a, a, a homeschool get together. Uh, okay, and I okay. would be the only man. Right. Right. With my so daughters. I... And there's a certain, a little like pat on the head that I would get like, oh, you're so cute that you're taking care of your daughters and educating them. Right. It, it was weird. <laughs> I can relate to that. So at, at a younger age, right? Like, uh, especially when the kids are, uh, in elementary you kind of involve a whole big group and uh, the play dates are uh, really just taking care of the kids right that's not as much fun that that bit I, I can I can relate to it because I hated going to these birthday parties where everyone's invited in the classroom right so it's like you don't know this person well enough uh, but they're in a birthday party the kids play and as they've come to middle school uh, I feel like they they have a more uh, a smaller subset of people and they interact with this set of people a little bit more often and now you want to know what are my kids friends like like you know <laughs> right? and that's where I'm like uh, so it's not too huge my play dates are much smaller it's like Drew, go bring two of your friends and we'll play a game right so it's it's it's, it's much smaller and then at this point um, it's also not entertaining like at younger age it's entertaining not just the kids but the parents accompany them it's also entertaining them now it's like the kids are on their own and they don't have all the kids want is hey leave us alone right? <laughs> they don't want much and if you if you give them all the supplies of candies and food they're happy so so that actually makes me feel good to kind of it's it's so easy to make little kids happy so why not take that joy right so uh, that's where i like uh, uh played it Fair enough. Uh, my son, my son's actually older. Um, I had him at a young age. Um, they all have the same mom. Um, and uh, he actually texted me last night and he said, hey, dad, did you know that Fry's Electronics went out of business? And I had said, well, yeah, I mean, they've been kind of on downhill slope since even I was a teenager, right? Right. And he said to me, and it, and it meant a lot because, you know, you always wonder if you have impact on your children, as, especially as they start doing, as you said, they start pulling away a little bit. They have their own autonomy. They have their own friend and peer groups. And since they're boys, they don't really share as much, that type of thing. Uh, and he said to me, I still remember the first time you took me to Fry's Electronics. It was an wow. electronic wonderland to me, and I loved it. Now, this would have been like 14 years ago, maybe even longer. And right. it just, it just made my whole night. Right. It's like, Oh my God. I, I, I don't think he meant it as affirmation. I don't even think he realized it was affirmation. I think he was, he was just, you know, just saying this memory, but it was such an affirmation to me that I did something that had an impact that he still thinks about. I, I had completely forgotten. Exactly. Right. 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 So, all right, well, let's, um, let's kind of scoop back here. Um, you're, your husband, he wanted to study. Did he want to study in the States? Is that what drove your move to Palo Alto? No. So uh, he actually moved. Uh, uh, he, he was with PayPal. He is with PayPal. So uh, okay. he was taking a tr transfer. Uh, I want to, uh, if you asked me five years ago, I would say the main reason I moved was because of family. Like I know I told the same thing again, but looking back now i almost feel like it was destiny right like my move to palo alto <laughs> because i had to work on green plum right so it was like uh, uh, you know there are those the sequence of events that happen for you to land at some place where at times you start to realize that oh this was destiny right so uh, my husband was in this uh uh program where he could try out different uh 
different teams for a uh, for two years like PayPal has this technology leadership program or something where every six months you can go try out a different team. There's a cohort of uh, people who can get into that. And he got into that. So he tried six months in Singapore, six months in Australia, six months in San Jose and uh, uh, San Francisco, right? So uh, when he moved to Australia, I didn't join him because kids were at school and I just did like visits right i just visited him a few times he used to visit that was a six month period where we were away uh but when it was uh us it was a slightly longer period that he wanted to come here where we decided this could be a good opportunity for us to try out going like we still he still had a job at singapore this was more of like a one year away from singapore and uh, that's how we came in here and when that happened um, I was by default going to take a transfer from Pivotal Labs in Singapore to Pivotal Labs at Palo Alto, right? That was my default choice. Uh, but what happened right before I was going to move was Pivotal Palo Alto, Pivotal Labs Palo Alto, right? I was in labs consulting. So uh, that one got consolidated in San Francisco. They're like, okay, no more labs office in Palo Alto. Uh, we just moved to, uh, it doesn't make sense to have two labs office in such small uh, distance apart. So that got moved. And then I was like, okay, what now? And just at the right time, I was introduced uh, by my office director then that, hey, by the way, there is this other team there that is Green Plum. Why don't you try there? <laughs> you know, so it's it's like the sequence of uh, uh, if, if the Palo Alto Labs office was still there, I don't think I would have ever gotten introduced to Green Plum. So, uh, so overall, I feel like destiny uh, <laughs> wanted me to work in Green Plum sometime, and because I love Green Plum, working in Green Plum so much now that I sometimes wonder what if Green Plum was not a part of my life? It would have been terrible. Like I'm so glad that uh, this whole change happened. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I feel that while it was one of the reasons was family and my husband coming here, was, the main reason was probably this, you know. <laughs> well, you know, if there isn't Green Plum, there's always Postgres QL. So, right. <laughs> and there's plenty of companies I mean, there. I consider Green Plum and Postgres, honestly, to be uh, oh, I agree. one piece because, uh, like I told you, uh, it's unbelievable that. 120 engineers are generating uh, pieces of code that is used in mission critical applications, right? Like we are being used in so many places and they're all like not even uh, some application used by like uh, uh, not so important applications, right? It's, it's like these are mission critical applications and when something serious, it is serious for Green Plum, and there is no way we could have achieved this without Postgres, right? Like, uh, I feel like look at any other uh, analytical database company, data warehouses, right? Like, uh, you will have thousands of employees working on that piece, right? Like, uh, the backing that we have from Postgres is probably the best thing that happened to Green Plum because. It's open source, and we have used Post Postgres is the underlying engine for Green Plum, right? So uh, I think that that makes uh, it run with few people and make it successful, right? And so I think uh, definitely Postgres, lots of pluses to give there. <laughs> well, I think I mean there's a there's a very aggressive and fastly growing movement that. Uh, considers Postgres um, more of a, a, a overarching thing, right? Where Postgres QL is part of Postgres. Yugabyte is part of Postgres. Greenplum is part of Postgres. Right. Um, and I mean, even Cockroach, even though their engine isn't Postgres, the protocol and driver interfaces is Postgres. That's right, um, yeah. And we, uh, and that's actually where people Postgres data came from, which is kind of a mission of, of the conference series is that, we want to be an inclusive conference for everything 
Postgres related, whether it be academic, whether it be professional, whether it be technology, whether it be uh, I run a calendar website and it just happens to back to Postgres, whatever the case may be, right? We want to be a very inclusive community where everybody is supported uh, individually as well as supporting each other to help every project succeed around Postgres. Um, I'm kind of curious. So distributed teams, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that, you know, command prompts been distributed for forever, but we're not 120 people. In fact, if we're ever 120 people, I have sold command prompt and I do not have a command prompt email and I'm somewhere else, probably standing on a soapbox yelling about things I would do if I were president, right? Something like that. <laughs> um, okay. But, uh, you know, when you, when you, what is it, how, how do you manage that many people remotely? I mean, are you using agile methods? Are you using hybrid methods, waterfall methods? What, what are you doing? Right. So this has been a lot of learning over time, right? Like, uh, so there's no uh, single, uh, uh, you know, method that we follow from the book, but it's, it's a continuously iterated method where, uh, some examples I want to say, right, on managing people from various places uh, is the communication needs to be like really good. Uh, you need to figure out what is, you need to follow the Goldilocks rule, right, where uh, you're working on different time zones. So you, what is too little and what is too much, right? Like you can't go on meeting every day and spoil all your evenings, but you can't go without meeting and not be in touch, right? So there's there's this uh, delicate balance that you need to strike to keep in touch with the various teams. Uh, at the same time, right? Like, uh, what do you do to, let's say, uh, build trust with each of these uh, geos, right? So uh, there is an advantage to uh, having site leaders, right, where, uh, there is a level of uh, trust established with the site leaders because they are local and you are talking to them more often, right? So, and they understand uh, more of the local context. Uh, so that's that's super useful. And then the site leaders can come together and talk more. Uh, there is also a, a piece of uh, discussions like you can't keep everything too formal, right? So uh, if you're working together in a team here, right? Like in one office, like you're not only talking about work, you do go have coffee together or you have those water cooler conversations. So uh, there needs to be uh, a bunch of unstructured events or even like meetings, it's okay to, not follow a structure, right? Like it, it's okay to drift away from structure sometimes so people open up and like uh, we know more about them, right? So uh, a combination of some of these. And another important thing when, when it comes to making uh, distributed teams work uh, is how you split the work, right? Like that is super important. Uh, we we have again learned this over time, right? So there have been cases where uh, we did okay. This team does this in the morning. This team does this in the evening. And like you know, uh, do you work on the same story together? Do you work on a whole different story? How do you interact? How do you kind of uh, communicate and be transparent about what you're working on so that somebody else can give you an advice if they know about that, right? So all these things are quite important. How you structure the team, whether it's, uh, uh, let's say you have like 10 developers in US and two developers for that team in, let's say China or India, it mm -hmm. feels like a big imbalance, right? So it, it always, the ownership aspect goes missing for the other geo. If you have like just two people from there and 10 people from here, right? So you've got to uh, balance things out uh, to be able to give ownership. Ownership piece is super important in global teams because there is no way you can kind of keep an eye out on all these 120 engineers if they're coming to office, are they really working? Are they uh, uh, 
you know are, are they taking care of the things that they're supposed to like it's really really hard it, unless you give them that ownership and they feel passionate about what they're working on like you don't have to then have any control it's like it's just it's just an autopilot right so uh, that's a very very important piece the moment you have like okay this geo owns this it's it's a it's slightly and and that's fine too uh, right like there are the way we have broken down uh, the teams, there's some uh, there's some teams that are completely in one geo. So they own this component completely, mm. right? And then there's some teams where this is a large enough component that we need support, almost 24 by seven to support our customers. Like, you know, the Greenplum core server itself is, is spread out across all the geos. And in that case, just keep the teams balanced, make sure that you provide all ways of communication. So, uh, so yeah, that's the, and the most uh, other important piece is to uh, have those weekly retros on like what worked well, what, because there was a case where uh, we thought we could uh, just churn a lot of stories out by doing a daily handoff right like okay i do this and then give this to india india does that and then give that to us we thought that that would work great in one particular case but that didn't because there was a retro conducted on okay what went well and then the people complained that hey i do something i write some code and next morning i come that whole code has changed. It's something else. It's so much of context switch, right? Like, and then you realize, okay, so this is the other thing. You provide a safe space to talk so that the team members can talk to each other and figure out, right? And then, okay, fine. Then they realize, let's make some changes here, right? At the same time, there's been like, there was another case for us where we were running some performance testing on some really expensive hardware, right? And that one, morning to night to night to morning the turnover was great and we saved a lot of money by just doing the performance testing 24 by 7 rather than like doing it just uh, during office hours of one geo right so so these are some uh, uh some things you try out and make continuous changes and uh be open for making any changes to make it successful so you mentioned a couple of things in there, keywords, I would call them, uh, for example, stories. You know, right. Stories is something um, that it's kind of an agile concept. That's correct. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was talking with some, I was mentoring some younger um, potential team members recently and they asked us about agile and I'm not a big fan of agile. And I don't know if it's that I'm too old or if it's that too many project managers that are terrible at their job, like landed on it and like grabbed it and like, oh, this makes me seem valid. Uh, and I have seen that in client after client after client. And that's not to say that's what you're doing. I don't perceive that at all. Um, but one of the things I say is Agile, Agile does have some really good focal points or, or principles. One is agility. In today's world, you have to have agility. If you don't, you just, you disappear, right? Um, and like the morning stand-up where you get together, this is what I'm working on, this is what I've got, these are my blockers, you know, I need you to get out of my way, whatever the case may be, right? Um, but the problem that I have with Agile is that there is a reason that you do not build skyscrapers with Legos. And Agile tends to build things with Legos, Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious, how do you manage that problem? Because Greenplum, even more so than PostgreSQL, is a beast. I mean, it is a massive beast of, of you're dealing with technology, with people with brain matter that is beyond the average by far. And the code base is intricate and the things that you can do with it, if you know how, are far beyond what PostgreSQL can do, what any normal relational database can do. How, how do you handle that? How do you keep the, how do you take two Legos and make sure they end up as one big, stronger block versus all the, the permeable and fractionable seams that get created? 
right so uh, that's why i say that uh, we are a really a good mix right so uh, we are agile in with a small letter a not so much of the capital letter a right so uh, we we follow some processes from this and we follow some processes from that right so uh, our idea here is we've got a few things here right we we need someone with product vision right it's not everybody does their own thing we need to come together in certain cases and like understand the vision of the product uh, so we have our product managers dealing with all that space right and then after that it's it's all about it's it's actually you have to start with the so it's slightly different where uh, you build lego and then uh, it becomes a big block versus you have to be thinking about the big block and then break it out into what does that mean what lego should be built right that's it's it's just the opposite way right so mm -hmm. that's what is going to make things work a little bit better because when you start building legos thinking this is going to uh, come through this it's it's hard but you always need to have that longer term vision handy so that you're building towards that right and then we have uh, some more processes right around giving these regular showcases like you you have to involve more community and collaboration is super important if within each team they break out things and make something happen it and then they realize when they have to come together that hey this doesn't really fit we built this whole big block with legos and this doesn't really fit right so uh, even even that fitting aspect has to happen continuously right so, like the integration needs to happen somewhat continuously where uh, you're talking to a larger community. So you discuss in mailing lists. We have these showcases where people come and project what they're doing and then they get all these questions like, hey, but how about this? And then those, there's some ideas that it brings in. Um, so I would say, and then again, when all things come together, you have to do things like performance testing, longevity testing. There's, there's a lot of other things that doesn't really come by default, right? When you're doing the smaller pieces and you need to slot out time for that as well. Like you can't say that, okay, this once this is done, we just go delivery. Like you have to like slot out some time. So honestly, uh, uh, I am a huge fan of testing, both manual testing as well as uh, automated testing, right? So it brings out a lot of uh, things. And as we, uh, um, as we even uh, understand some bugs that our customers reported or self-reported, we do understand that, okay, that was a gap in this testing. We've not tested this scenario. Like you keep building on that. Uh, I think that is one thing that's gonna keep things strong and uh, makes that block really, really strong if every part is tested. Do you find, um, so actually, hold on, let's, let's put a pin in that because I think that's important. I, there is one thing you, you brought about earlier and you said that I'm not sure what it would be like not having green plum in my life. What, what, what is it that's so strong to you? Be, because one of the things I think is important is that green plum, although it is a project, it is a corporate project. It is a product. Right. Unlike PostgreSQL.org, which is a community led project, although the majority of developers now work for EDB. Um, what what is it about Greenplum? What did drive what's giving you that passion? What gives you or actually, let's even take it down one more notch because you mentioned ownership, having ownership of tasks, responsibilities, whatever features. You are being compensated and building for a, I don't know, half a billion, three quarter of a billion dollar a year entity that used to be independent, um, something for somebody else. 
what gives you the, the what allows you to have that passion for something that, that, that allows you to feel ownership? How does Green Plum allow that to thrive? Right. So uh, the reason I, I said uh, I'm so glad Green Plum came to my life was it's a land of opportunity, right? Like there is so much opportunity out here. And I, I, I know I said the ownership piece, right? What allows you to thrive is a big part of that, right? Uh, is the people people you work with super important like uh and when you see passionate people around you it's it's infectious right like it's it's almost like i see ivan and jock and, and they talk about green I, I really want to talk about green plum so i i am sure you've interacted with them so uh so th that is one piece and the people around you and just the the second thing is uh when you know that what you're doing has an impact, right? That is a whole, whole different story, right? Like when you when you know that you built some feature that someone's using, or you help this person uh, to become something better, it just it's a whole different feeling, right? Like it's it's um, that is the piece that gives you a lot of satisfaction. And uh, there is, uh, uh, even if it's, uh, I'm not coding right now, but then I know the level of satisfaction that our folks get that uh, Green Plum is open source. I know we are a commercial company and we, uh, we do uh, things, but at the same time, uh, there is a sense of pride that we are open source and it drives the quality. I, I mean, we have a combination of closed and open source projects, honestly, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's okay, uh, right? I almost uh, constantly advocate that treat a closed source project like an open source, right? Like it's just that the community that you're interacting with changes slightly, but if you're constantly thinking open source, it just makes the quality of the product so much better because you are doing reviews and you're thinking that this needs to be read by so many more people in this like you're automatically working with a better standard right so uh so that is another thing that brings a sense of pride uh right so it's so a green plum being open source the people in green plum and just the feeling that your product is getting used in critical applications like healthcare, IoT, or uh, um, finance, finance, and uh, you know, government. Uh, so it it just does feel really, really important that you're doing an important piece of work. That helps. You touched on something there: um, the feeling you get when you help a person be better. Um, that is actually that that touches on something here. It's one of the reasons we help found people Postgres data, because for a very long time, especially PostgreSQL.org, it's it's software first, right? It's it's the code first, and we found that that ideology or that mentality was leaving a whole population behind. Right. And so we focused on people first, and that's why before the pandemic, obviously, we're still trying to ramp up from that. Uh, at our larger events, for example, we would hold um, uh, uh, resume review for college students coming into the workforce. Uh, we would have uh, sponsors, uh, have managers volunteer to do mock interviews to help them with their interview skills or even review their LinkedIn profile, right? Help people interact on a way that and you know touch base on certain communication styles that aren't going to work in a peer reviewed or an interview process those types of things and we've received emails years later even that have said you know because of some of the things that you or your team or or so and so said or did or helped me with i am now allowed or i'm able to afford to pay for my family. I can get married. I can have children. I can, you know, have a home. Uh, and I actually know how to enjoy my job. And at command prompt, right, 
uh, we also have this uh, a professional life and leadership project. It's called Intrepidus Vita, which is Latin for fearless life. And that's actually what this, the, the short bus is all about. It's about showing people that for some people going to the office and being in the cubicle and having the water cooler and the 10 minute break, that, that fits and that works. And they're able to excel in that and good for them. But for a very large part of the population, and I would argue the majority of the population, that is demonstrably destructive to the emotional well-being of that person. Right. It's just that we have been over really ever since the office came about. So, you know, the last 150 years or so, um, we've been engineered over time to say we're supposed to go to the office. Right. We're supposed to do this. We're supposed to do that. But now, I mean, if you think about what you and I are doing right here, we're having this great professional conversation. We're learning from each other. Uh, when we're done with this, I have another conference call. I'm sure you've got work you got to do. We're getting our jobs done. And I, I assume you're in your home office. Right. Um, and I'm in a short bus sitting in the middle of nowhere getting 288 megabit over 4G. <laughs> I'm still doing my job. Right. right. And being able to help someone be better, a better person is so fundamental to, I think, making all of us better. Absolutely. You know, getting rid of that, that vitriol, whether it be political or whether it be, I don't have to do this, what, whatever it is, but allowing right. people to see the bigger picture about self-improvement. And that's where I want to, we're running low on time, and, and I, but this is where I want to really make sure that we touch. What I want to know is how do you nurture your team? You did touch that base on that a little bit. But specifically, and in my opinion, most important, how do you encourage continuous learning? Because right. a person, it, it's so easy for them to say, this is my box. This is my job. I don't have to learn more. I don't have to self-improve. I do this to get my paycheck. How do you right. encourage a person to be better? Right. So uh, a big part of that is actually knowing the person a little bit more, right? So... Uh, so sometimes you've got to be a sounding board for this other person to like first find out like it's it's easy to give goals and get those things done right but uh i feel like we are spending most of our time at work right like most of our conscious time a minimum of work. a third of our life exactly and and might as well make it a happy place, right? So, so what's the point? Uh, you know, it's 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 a short life, and if we make that a third of our life terrible, there is no point. So, the one thing that I always ask my team members is, what's it that makes you want to come back to work tomorrow? Do you feel like that? Like, do you want to come back to work? Like, it's not just a, like money is one thing, right? Like, yes, people want to come back to work for money, but then the passion is the other thing, right? So uh, a part of, and, and the passion comes only because you're learning. Like the day you stop learning and it becomes same work today as yesterday and the same work tomorrow as today, it becomes boring, right? So, uh, so that's those are the aspects we kind of try and touch upon. Like, first, you've got to build that trust with your reports, and uh, be able to talk. Like, and and I, I, as I touched upon that previously, you can't keep every of your conversation very formal. You've got to go structured, unstructured, structured, unstructured, because otherwise, you don't get to know the person. Right. So when you know the person, and especially in remote teams, right, like where you're not really seeing the person or like you've not connected with that person, it's it's a whole, you've got to do this a little bit more often. And then uh, the safety bits, right, like it's OK, like we are all humans and it's OK to not get done with something sometimes. Right. Like it's it's OK. Like you got some problem. You didn't fix it. You made a bug. You, you made uh you created a bug in the code it's okay like you know it's okay to accept these things and work towards uh, improvement of those things it's not like uh if if you create an unsafe environment people are going to try and hide these things right and that's a very uh um a, 
bad way, right? So uh, the best way is building that trust. And at that point, any conversation becomes easy. There's no, it, the, the point of, is this an easy conversation or is this a hard conversation goes away because you've kind of removed the ice between the two of you and you're able to make conversations better. And then at that point, uh, they are free to tell, you know, in, at, sometimes there are people who say, hey, I'm really bored of this. Okay, fine. So do you want to try another team? Like maybe this is going to be a better fit or it, it's okay to even have such conversations with your managers, right? It's, it's uh, not that you're given some piece of work and you have to finish it. That's not the only thing. It's more of, uh coaching and uh, a lot of times people have solutions like that was one thing when i became a manager initially right um the one thing i thought was i need to have answers for everything right which is like a totally wrong thing that it's okay not to have answers nobody like, has that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> like i thought that okay fine this is my report and i have to be this good manager who has answers for everything otherwise this person's not going to trust me right so that's not the point right the the bigger thing is listening and working it out together as a team right like neither of us are going to have answers on these things but okay, let's see what's the next step we can do to make tomorrow a little bit better than today, right? So uh, that's, again, a continuous cycle. It's interesting because, you know, one of the things when I, when I help peer review uh, new team members and things like that, and there's always this, and I'm sure you've run into this. I mean, when you hire someone new, if the boss is looking at your work, right, there's always a little bit of a, from the other side, right? Um, and one of the things I always say is, don't, and a part of my friends, I said, don't try to bullshit me. If you don't have the answer, say, I don't have the answer, but I will find out or right. I will learn it or something like that. It's okay not to know everything. The right. only thing that I won't accept is an unwillingness to improve on what you do know, right? If you are a person that like, no, you hired me to do X, I'm going to do X. You're not going to be employed with me very long. If you say you hired me to be at, do X, I don't know how to do Y. I will learn how to do Y. You will have great success. Okay. Um, and as we wrap this up, um, let's talk about two points. Uh, it's really, yeah, it, it's two points. The two points I want to talk about are how do you recommend especially managers, because I am not a manager. In fact, whenever I, whenever I have to have the hard conversation, it's, it's usually I have to have the hard conversation with a manager, which is even worse. Um, and then what do you think, what is your advice for junior team members looking to move into leadership? And I think it's important here, especially in tech, even though it, it's kind of a, you know, a horse that keeps getting beaten, but it's especially important because tech is still predominantly male. So what is it that you would have advice for women to, especially in junior roles, to help them move into leadership positions? Right. Um, great question. And uh, uh, the one thing that I want all the junior members to know, right, is there is a slight misconception at least in some of the geos that i have seen that moving uh, next level means you have to move to management right like uh, it's it's a part of being promoted right so uh, so that's one thing i do want people to think through because for being a manager you've got to be really really passionate about talking to people, understanding their problems, coming up with solutions. To, like sometimes it's it's not just a, don't link it with career growth, right? Like it's linking it with passion, right? So, uh, and there is way, there are ways to grow in tech as well, right? So if you feel passionate about it, go for it. If you don't feel passionate about it, it's perfectly okay. Like 
we have good people who are non managers as well right so uh, so that's totally okay so don't make a choice that this is a, a career move because let's say you become a manager you lead people or something it's more of are you really passionate about you know uh, being this people person right so that is one thing that i would say then the other thing uh, uh, that i would say is we are going to have loads and loads of oh my god now what moments right so like you know i i it's like innumerable times this happens right and whether it's a manager or a non manager and uh, there are there are many times when you feel like okay this is the end right how will this survive uh, but there's only something better that comes in that's that's the reality i've seen this multiple 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 times in life so never that is actually the perfect opportunity so when you want to shift into let's say leadership or management see uh, identify those opportunities see where people are like oh my god now what and jump in there to help right and yeah, it's just the willingness and passion to help will go a long long way so uh, so new beginnings are often disguised as like painful endings so in when you feel like oh my god this person left what do i do now like you know this how will this team survive you'll get someone else or like oh my god this company closed down now what something better is actually waiting for uh, for you right so there's so many of those moments that you go through in your life but when you look back after you faced it then you realize ah okay this was why this this whole thing happened with it it is going to be an opportunity that opens up and grab that opportunity when you have that right so just stay calm and address that as an opportunity instead of getting upset and sitting through that right so you need to jump into that opportunity when you feel uh such things happen so that would be my yeah, advice so the and it, that boils down to try to solve the problem right when the problem represents itself don't run from it try to solve it and specifically yeah. like you said when you're in one of these oh my god the world is ending you know, dogs are falling from the sky kind of situations, um, you know, being able to take that proactive approach will allow you to shine and allow you to pot potentially move into that leader posi leadership position. Right. But I think that there's another side. I mean, my experience is there's another side, um, especially, um, and, you know, I don't know that it, it, it's, it's male versus female. I think it's a personality type, but I do think it lends itself to females more. I think that there's a responsibility as a manager or as a leader, because that's that can be two different things, because I am not a manager, um, to inspire or to encourage or to even guide or mentor someone, in, especially in tech, who would not normally step up like say you know hey susan we have this problem and i think you are especially suited to solve it can you help us out um what what do you think about that are, are we in a situation i mean because obviously there's a lot of right ways right and there's a lot more wrong ways but there's a lot of right ways to do this but do you think that there's value especially with it, like females in tech women in tech where we can encourage them to basically back them up right say hey you can do this i've got your back let, let okay. let's let's do this together so, but allow them to shine not you right yeah i mean honestly if the people under you are shining then you automatically shine right so uh let me stop you right there. I, I I want you to repeat that because there are so many people that don't understand that. Right. So uh, I want to say by making another person successful, right, you are successful. You're only yes. more successful by making this other person successful. So uh, and you will be surprised on how many people actually come to help when you uh, like 
when you are generally stepping in to try out something new, it is sometimes we feel like, okay, can I manage this? Can I do this or not? We have all those question marks, but then you have people's back, right? Like there are people trying to help. It's, it's the number of good people in this world is surprisingly high. And when you actually get into uh, trying something out, help comes. So just go in and get these things. Uh, I mean, don't hesitate, right, to get into this problem. You have people's back. Uh, pe I mean, your manager should probably have your back, but there's also others in this world who's going to like help you through that. So, and sometimes it's a matter, this again, I tell with respect to remote teams, like it's okay to ask for help, right? Because you don't, when you are not looking at the person day in and day out, you kind of don't understand what they're thinking or what they're struggling with, right? So sometimes you've got to open up that, hey, I have this problem, right? Like when you open up for a problem, you get the solution. If you, uh, so it's it's hard for people to just understand maybe this person is struggling, like, let me try, like, you know, it's okay to go ask when you have this problem, but don't hesitate to step in, right? Like it, it's, it's, and also, don't hesitate to help others, right? So by helping others, uh, you're really helping yourself, right? So that uh, it's, it's your, you are, I, I want to repeat that once again, you shine when you make others shine because it's just, it just only gets brighter, right? So, uh, so yeah. And with that, this has been More Than a Refresh, a podcast about data and the people who regulate. Our guest today was Divya Borgov, Yes, you got that. <laughs> engineering senior director, direct, excuse me, engineering senior director at VMware. Thank you very much. This podcast is hosted by JD, Command Prompt founder and Postgres conference chair, and is produced by me, Lindsay Hooper, director of events at Command Prompt Inc. Command Prompt provides Postgres support, professional services, custom development, and community leadership. Since 1997, we've focused on providing just excellent service, custom tailored to your organization's needs. We'll see you soon, wherever you get your podcasts.